right, super duper. How to series, walking in the spirit. Everyone say walking in the spirit. Now what you need to know, the term walking in the spirit is synonymous, synonymous as walking in the Lord. Would you agree? Uh, walking in the spirit is synonymous with walking in God. Would you agree? So when we say walking in the spirit, we're walking into God, right? We're walking in God, right? <clears throat> God forbid if we walked in ourselves, right? <laughs> All right. So these lessons are designed to point out that we are spiritual creations and that we were designed to live from the inside out, not the outside in. We weren't designed to run by our feelings. Even though feelings are important, they should follow our faith. It seems all our lives we have been looking for fulfillment everywhere. Yet the emptiness that we had inside was the need for our God. God created us for fellowship and to walk with him. The true blessings come from walking, excuse me, in the Lord or in the spirit and obeying his will for our lives. You might have already found out or maybe already figured this out, but maybe not. Nothing has been created that, uh, nothing that has been created can take the place of God, our creator. Only God can fill the void in our hearts and only walking in the spirit can produce what we are looking for, the fulfillment, true fulfillment and contentment. We will never become all that we can be without being saved and learning how to walk in the spirit. Would you agree? Amen. So we know the scripture says, so if you'll take your Bibles in your scripture there in John chapter 3, we're going to look at the religious man talking to Jesus. We're going to see that this religious man was involved in a great big system of works. He was a religious Pharisee named Nicodemus. And just like we discussed early, earlier, that the religious people of the day wanted to impress God with works. But they found out that works simply did not impress God. But they noticed that something was different with Jesus because every time he did something, miracles happened. So let's see what happened to this man. This man still had a heart to know God. So there was a, na a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless, you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you see the word see there? You know what that Greek word is? It means to perceive or understand. So if you put that in too with the word see, he cannot see or understand the kingdom of God. How many here know that matches up with the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness to him, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So let's read on. Okay. It said verse 6, it says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. See? This is flesh. This is not going to heaven. Can you tell me why, Denise, our flesh isn't going to heaven? Yes. Yeah, it's got sin in it. And God can't receive sin unto himself, can he? So Jesus did, but he did it for us. So our body's not going to go like we have. That's a flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So we can't enter in. So what does God promise? He promises at the resurrection or the rapture that he's going to change you in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, the in Christ will rise first and you which are ready shall be changed, right? Death will be swallowed up in victory. This corruption will put on in corruption. Amen? All right. So basically, we can either follow God from the old man, which grows corrupt, or we can follow God from the new man, which is renewed day by day. Which one do we choose? Now, who do you think, whose help we're going to need to do that? God's help. And if you are, 
want to follow God and really grow in God, then you're going to have to ask God to help you. You can't do it any other way. We have not because we ask not. All right, so look what he said. So Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And do not marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. For the wind blows where it wishes, and you can hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. What he's really saying is that you, Nicodemus, you do everything by the book. Do, do, do. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If you, if you have a responsibility, you need to go through the checklist. But they were trying to please God by going by the book. Thou shalt not steal. Do you steal? Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Do you have a God before you? Yeah, whenever you're thinking of yourself and you're doing the religious work, you put another God before him. So anyway, to get past all of that kind of thing. Okay, so it says, marvel not that I say you must be born again. So as the spirit moves. Now let me ask you something. <clears throat> How many here have a basic routine in the morning? We all do, don't we? To some degree, and that's, that's not anything wrong with that. But sometimes, if our routine repeats itself every day, every day, and if that routine is in our religious acts for God, Satan's going to pick us off because he knows what we're going to do next. He knows after he made that suggestion, you're going to what you're going to say next. We're pretty easy to figure out. But when somebody that's born again, they're like the wind. God moves them. You can't tell where they come, where they're going to go. So is every man born of the Spirit. So we're moved by God. Can you say amen? We're led by God. Can you say amen? And Satan doesn't know how to fight that. I get all excited about this. and He doesn't know how to fight it. He can fight our routines. He can block some of the namby-pamby stuff we think that's religious, but he can't block what God is saying to you by revelation and what God is telling you to do by the Spirit because God orders our steps and Satan can't fight against God. If God be for us, who can be against us? Let's drop down in John chapter 10. We're going to just look at a very simple scripture I, I, I quoted early, earlier. <clears throat> And okay, and Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and the robber. So we know the thief and the robber in the Bible is a devil. He wants to get into God. Remember when God uh, when God told him, Don't eat the tree, and they ate the tree and they fell? God removed the tree of life, didn't he? And you know why he removed the tree of life? Because if they would have ate it, they would have been demonically manifesting in the presence of God through his kids. Instead, we're kept captive on this planet. Until we accept Jesus, that's the only way we can get out of here. That's why he's called the perpetuation for our sin, the means of escape. Can you say amen? He is the way of escape. But if we don't have a daily walk with them, you're li Jesus is liable to be over there and you're somewhere over in the circus in the tent and Jesus is ready to go home. You're wandering around religiously. I know God wants me to win souls. Y yeah, but he doesn't want you to beat him to salvation. Can you say amen? He wants you to lead him to salvation. Sometimes we come on very intimidating. You know, we got to be careful. We want to make people hunger to what we got. Drop down to John 14, verse, verse 6. Look at this. Very important. Now, I remember uh, you, sis, you asked me, why do we pray to the Father in Jesus' name? And we, we got a bunch of nice answers from that. And because no one can come to the Father except through? Right. So all these religions that are trying to climb up some other way are what? Man's attempt to be thieves and robbers. Buddhism, Mohammedism, you know, transcendental denation or whatever, 
you know, reincarnation, all of these things are man's efforts to appease God and to get to the nirvana. We can't get to heaven without God. Can you say amen? So most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold but climbs up some other way, you're a thief and a robber. But Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We go through Jesus. We release through Jesus. We approach God through Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name through Jesus of Jesus. Do you see? Why? Because he, if I have to use this modern word, he's the portal that we enter in. The Satan can't follow us. He's the doorway. He's the valley. He's the mountain. He's the glory. He's the patient. He's the wisdom. You can't go in any other way. Stop trying to impress everybody. Folks, if you want to impress your husband, be like Jesus. If you want to impress your wife, I'm working hard on it. And God says, stop it. I'm working hard in you, Carrie. Just surrender. And then I know my wife will be pleased. But if I'm working really hard, then I'm going to make promises to her I can't keep. No mean to do that. And I'm going to do that, and she's going to look at me, and I'm going up one minute, and I'm down the next, and down one minute, and up the next. Why? Because I'm walking for God in my flesh, and I'm making promises. God says, let your yay be yay that I should be making. Instead, Lord, I surrender. I need help. Help me to be somebody you want me to be. And you watch. He'll turn you into that person, and your wife or your husband won't be able to keep their hands off you. Hello? Worst thing you can do to a woman is be bipolar up and down all the time. Women don't like that. They want solid. Uh, looking at me, my wife wants to see that I am solid. She doesn't, she's not my mother. And I can be a problem. If I don't go to God and have God help me with my problems, she's going to become my mother. Because she wanna, she'll want to help me so bad. Or if I want to help my wife so bad. If she was on the other foot. You see? No, no. You go in with God and have God literally wipe the old you out. And grow up a new you. And if you don't like the old you, then die. Well, what do you mean by die? Surrender. Lord, I'm supposed to be crucified with Christ. Yet I'm alive, but not me. Christ who lives inside of me. Right? So how do I keep letting Christ get stronger and stronger inside of me? By daily meeting with God first thing, surrendering, getting dosed with the Holy Ghost, getting saturated, getting radiated, and don't get up until you are. For me, it only takes five to ten minutes. Now, probably when I first started doing something like that, take one or two hours to try to get my head to shut down so I can open up my heart to God. I mean, that. come on now. Have you ever had, you know, go to sleep at night and your head would not stop from racing? Huh? It happens in prayer too. Just stop. Okay, let's go on. Now, there is no other way to be saved than to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. No other way. Do you agree with that? Go with me to 1 Corinthians in your notes there. Chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Basically tells us that our outer man, our natural man, or woman, cannot receive spiritual revelation. So when you read your Bible, do you read it with your head or your heart? That's right. And you want to know why people can't get much out of the Bible? Because they're trying to read it with their head. And it doesn't work. God, God, your intellect really is boring to God. What are you going to dazzle him with? He knows everything. So the idea is get out of the head, get into the heart. God wants to see some tears. Don't formulate them. Let him touch your heart, massage your heart till you begin to break down. When you break down, you see, God is the master 
clay worker. You follow what I'm saying? And when you get a piece of clay and you slap it down there, you got to do some pulling and you got to do some shaping and everything like that. And it might come out really crazy. And you just slap it down again and start working it again. That's exactly what's happening to you. God is working your clay out. He's working you out. He's bringing out the godness in you. Amen. And listen, you've got a big old air bubble in your flesh. You're going to pop it. No, if you keep running away from him, it's going to take all year long for him to pop of it. You're running from not getting serious with God? He's got all the time in the, in the universe. You don't. Surrender. What do we used to preach years ago? If we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart, that God, right? He says we need to bow our knee either now or we're going to have to bow our knee later, Right? So let's do it now, and let's do it daily. Wouldn't it be neat if you bowed in your prayer clause and you met with God, and God says, stand up. I'm very pleased in you. Oh, what? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a surprise? Why not? If you're consistently getting dosed with God, he'll be very pleased with you because he'll be looking at you and seeing himself in, me, in you. You know what my dad used to look at me and says, you know, son, I really get a kick out of you. Even some of the dumb things you do, you didn't use where the silly things you do. I said, why is that? He says, because I see me in you. I see a lot of me in you. Very important. God sees a lot of him in us. But he wants that him part out where everybody else can see and enjoy it. You know, the him part is very friendly. The you part probably very crabby who knows you know so we want to go so the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them nor can he know them Satan wants you to keep in the intellectual realm keep you in the flesh realm why because you won't know anything how many Christians have you probably ran into through the years Pastor Kerry that you look at them and they've been saved 40 years, 50 years, 30 years, and they don't know a thing. That's pretty scary as a pastor to see that. They don't know a thing. They don't know how to forgive. They don't know how to repent. They don't know how to read their Bible. They're waiting for God to whack them once so they get in the Bible. Or if they do something wrong, They'll feel really, really sorry, and then they'll read their Bible for two weeks as some kind of penance. Folks, that's dumb. Read your Bible every day, no matter you like it or not, because you have nothing to do with it. God's design in you does. You see what happens, and you know, I, I hope I can get this done, is when you are born, when mom and dad have you conceived, when mom has you conceived in, your, in your, her room, God already put his spirit and a soul in, in that. And, of course, the embryo is of the flesh. But it has a spirit and soul in it, right? Okay, so what happens is God has a perfect spirit. He breathed the breath of life in it. So perfect spirit. But the soul, each one of our souls has a personality. So Denise, there's a lot of Denises in the world. But there's only one with the blueprint and the personality of this Denise. And we don't need, what we need to do, excuse me, I said the wrong word. We, what we really need to realize is the uniqueness that God gave us when we were born. And what happens to us when we don't pursue him for him to show us the blueprints so what he's doing with us, he's beginning to show us what his plan is for our life, the blueprints of those plans. And whenever we consult the word and we walk with him and we saturate and get radiated in his presence, he brings those blueprints up to the surface and we find ourselves doing those things. See, I knew a long time ago I had the gift of gab. That was part of my personality. But God knew he was going to use it for his glory. I was just using it for girlfriends and, and popularity. But when I got saved, God says, no, I want you to share the gospel. I made you a mouth. 
Got a smile on you, dear. Right? But the natural man, all of our natural men, is not going to get in line with that. We want to do our own thing. I mean, I, 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 kids, have, I, I talk to a lot of teenagers, and they don't know what I'm, what I'm doing, so I'll talk to them. So isn't God good? And, you know, gave, just got through get, answering their prayer and gave them something. So why don't you just ask the Lord, say, thank you, Jesus. And they'll look at you like, I'm not going to do that. See, they've lost that tenderheartedness when they were little kids. And they've grown into this where their flesh is starting to take them over. They're not encouraged by mom and dad. Pretty soon they're going to leave the, woo, the, the, the nest. And they're going to go out there thinking that they're all that. And they're going to get wholly kicked to the street. If we don't let God, if they don't get the relationship going with God like they need. And I am talking to kids. Those of you by YouTube, too, the children. If you don't get that done, then you're going to have the worst time in your life. And if you live, something might turn out of it. You can't exist on mom and dad's prayers. You can't. You have to develop a strong relationship on your own. Because when you get away from mom and dad, your relationship with God is what's going to sustain you through life. Amen? Amen. Do you want to end up to be... A, a no go nowhere, do nothing person? Or do you want like God to guide your steps and, and fulfill your life and you go back and have no regrets? Linda and I had a discussion, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago. I said, honey, do you have any regrets about us being together? What did you say? Not at all. And she asked me, I said, not at all. But when God's working on your life on a daily basis, the regrets die out. The things, the things that kind of get in the way just die away. And that's cool. Because we got enough junk. We don't need any extra. Can you say amen? All right, so the natural man cannot do that. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judgeth all things. That's the Greek word for to discern. A spiritual person discerns whether or not they'll let that person be their friend or they'll eat that meal. That's okay. That is discerning something whether it's good for you or not. Having our senses exercised to discern good from evil. Same word. But then the Bible tells us not to judge. That means we can discern something, but then we put a judgment on somebody for being a ding-dong. Now, one of the th words that God is helping with me, with my wife's praying diligently for me, is I used to throw the word idiot around a lot. That idiot, what did he do that for? You think about how God sees that. <laughs> so, excuse me, God. So the word idiot is pretty much gone out of my vocabulary except for tonight, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but God begins to wash those things away. He says, now you are clean through the water, the word that I've spoken unto you. But we've got to apply ourselves to the washing. Hey, listen, you don't take a bath, you're going to stink it. You take a bath, that means mom's not going to wash your armpits. Dad's not going to wash your armpits. you got to wash your armpits. You know what I'm saying? you got to go in and read the Bible. Mom's not going to read the Bible for you, right? We're still talking about kids. Pastor's not going to do this for you. Some people want me to do everything for them. No, I told you what to do. And if you're not going to do it, don't ask me again because I'm going to tell you the same thing. And then I'm going to say, what would you do with the first thing I said for you to do? Well, I didn't know. so well, you want to ask for another thing to do and you haven't done the first thing? You see what I mean? So some practical sense and some things. But God wants us on our own because we love him to pursue him in the spirit. Say amen, somebody. So it says, but who has known the mind, the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. We have what? Now remember in Ezekiel, I think in Jeremiah too, it says that God would write his laws on their mind and on their hearts. And they will have nobody the need to teach them. But he would teach them. Right? Now, most people at that time don't even understand what he's talking about. What he's going to do, he says he's going to put more than the law on the hearts and on the minds. 
He says, I'm going to come into your heart. I know it all, pals. Invite me into your heart now and then tap my source so I can teach you the way to look at things. I can teach you how to talk. That God can teach us how to walk. Boy, I tell you, it's exciting, right? But the natural man received not any of that. Why? Because the natural man fights God all the time. He's got a curse in your natural man. Your natural man wants to take the credit, wants to do it your way. Amen? And a certain amount of that's okay if it's God-directed. But if we're just doing our own thing, we're going to grow up to be pretty rotten people. We don't want to do that. All right. Take a breath. Okay. All right. So, a couple of points. There is only one way. Whose way? Amen. Highway or the byway, right? Two, the car and the fuel is illustration. I, you know, I have a wonderful automobile, but it does not burn water. And that's what happens to people. You run on God, everybody. Every human being runs on God. But we want to shove self-water in. I don't want to, I don't want to put fuel in me. I don't, want to, I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to pray. I don't want to do all that. So what are you going to do? Run on yourself? Water? Well, we, of course we're not. Because we don't have the energy. We don't have the stamina. We might be able to do some good things for a while. But after a while, we're going to get tired. Why? Because the energy that we need to sustain us through the project that God wants us to do it is either letting God do the project in us and through us, or we're trying to do it for God to impress him. And we know that that'll not work at all. So religion is man's attempt to reach God. Would you say that's a good answer? That a good definition is man's attempt to reach God? Tower of Babel. How would you define that? Man's attempt to reach God without Jesus. Uh -huh. What was wrong with Cain's sacrifice? It was Cain's attempt to please God without doing it according to the way it was designed. As much as I love to fly, I'm not going to get on the top of the rooftop and jump off to the parking lot and think flapping my arms and kicking my legs is going to break my fall. Folks, people without Jesus are in a free fall. And it might take, the uh, end of their life might take a shortened part of their life, but there's only one way to keep from falling. Can anybody tell me? J-E-S-U-S, he's my Lord and King. So making peace with him, walking with him, talking with him, having him rule and reign over our life, submitting ourselves to him, and relinquishing, I have a problem with that word, our own self-control will find ourselves enveloping, developing, and turning into like Jesus Christ almost overnight. You want to know why certain people grow up overnight and other people it takes all their life? Because the people are either serious or they're not. The people that take all their life to get what some people can get in a month is a, a show of lack of seriousness and they don't understand what Jesus is doing with them. We have no life outside of God. If that you thought it was, you did, read uh, John 15. I am the vine, my father's husband man. Any branch in me that bears not fruit is cast out. That's a, that's a religious person. He's talking about a religious person. It's a person who looks like a branch, has leaves, but there's no fruit. Why did Jesus curse that fig tree? Well, he went on the time of the figs. There's supposed to be figs on that fig tree, but there was no figs. So, and that's a symbol of religion. We look like a fig tree. We even smell like a fig tree. We even act like a fig tree, but we produce no figs. And so our job is to yield to God and let God produce the figs in our heart. Can you say amen? Without me, you can do nothing, you know. So we get that, but you know, sometimes we need to be reminded how important it is. Acts chapter 4, if you go in your Bible there, says this. 
nor is there any salvation in any other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby they must be saved. And that name is Yahweh, right? Uh, Adonai? Huh? No. Do you know, want to know why Jesus is the name? He took a, a, a natural name like Fred. Many Freds. Many Jesuses. Why? Because Joshua is a Jesus. If Joshua would have given you rest, we would have not looked at it. But see, some translations use the word Jesus giving you rest. No, it's Joshua. Because the word Joshua in Hebrew is the word Jesus in Greek. And the word Jesus in Greek is the word Joshua in Hebrew. It means Savior. Hello. So, we don't want to run around and talk languages. I mean, if you're talking to Jews, go ahead and use, you know, Joshua. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Joshua, the Savior. I command, you know, but, you know, I rebuke you in Yahweh, El Shaddai. No, God said, use the name of Jesus. It's all culminated down to that one little pinpoint that when you use that name, all of heaven is backing it. There isn't any God scratching and says, well, today we're not going to honor the name of Jesus. Well, we know that, okay? Let's go down to Acts chapter 16. Look at this. Verses 16 through 18. Here's an example. Now, it happened as we were in to pr went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination, she was a fortune teller, tarot card reader, horoscoper, you know, tea leaf thing, that kind of thing, all forbidden from God. Okay, and she had a spirit of divination for divining through evil spirits the future. And she met us, who brought uh, her masters much profit by fortune telling. And the girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us a way. Did you see the word a way there in your Bible? Yeah, it's a way, actually. Because if the next phrase, then you wouldn't get it. And thus she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. He came out what? Immediately? No, came out that very hour. See, when I cast out devils, sometimes they come out immediately. Sometimes it takes a while. Meanwhile, once I re delivered the command, once I released the anointing, I turned my back on the spirit and start worshiping God. Why? Because that spirit knows it's been charged. That spirit knows it's been commanded. That spirit knows that Jesus is in charge. And now that spirit has to go no matter what. He's not going to re-engage me. You think of I'm going to doubt. I just turn my back on it. Start praising the Lord. Or sit down. You got any coffee? Sit down. Drink some coffee. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That thing's manifesting pretty soon. It's out. Amen. Why? Because you turn the package over to the master. And the master does not fail. Right, Denise? Jesus never fails. Amen. Religion might fail. So we see the picture right there. It says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Well, she got delivered and they got thrown in jail, didn't she? You know, she got delivered and everybody got upset. So they put Paul and Silas in jail. And then we had a revival in Acts 16. Remember the earthquake and the jails opening right after they busted him for casting out a spirit on a diviner. Now, Linda will tell you when she was a secretary in my old church and I'm pastoring, we've had many diviners and weird people show up, tried to give a talisman, you know, to... I bring this. Remember those things? Sometime I'll let you tell the story of some of the weird, whacked out stuff we saw. And I'm sure you guys have seen some too. The people doing all of that kind. But you know what? The devil is really has no power against Jesus. Now, if he could pull you away from Jesus and get you to think that you're bringing deliverance, then he'll wear you out. You know? we just in charge, command it out, and don't take if, and, or but for any other kind of excuse. Can you say amen? All right, Acts 19, look at this one, 11 through 20. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. 
Now, folks, something about the anointing. When you're a consistent minister, now, that doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. But uh, somebody that is, tra- uh, how can I put it? I want to make sure I put it right. A minister of God, depending, it doesn't matter what makes a Smith Wigglesworth as convinced to just another person. Why was Smith so powerful? And why was this other minister that we hardly even hear it? Yet they have the same Jesus. What's the difference? That person's exposure to God. Okay? And not compromising his life. Remember he had lived in the house? Hardly have any visitors. One of the things God told me, he says, in the latter part of my life, he was going to use me more. But I'd have to be disciplined and who I let in my house, who I let going on, on this property, because there's a certain set of partners that we want. that We enjoy the peace of God here. You know what I mean? So we have to protect a little bit of that. But you take somebody, you know, well, just use you, Denise. I've been using you all night. Denise got a call of God, and she stays consistent. Doesn't mean she's not going to have problems. But she starts off, she's doing good, God's blessed her, but she has a rough situation on and on. Back about 30, 40 years of the, doing the same thing, even though she's had some rough times. The anointing is so strong on you now, you have 30 years of constant anointing. You can't get rid of that. That's just it. And that's why we need to be consistent daily because the anointing soaks and soaks and soaks and permeates and soaks and permeates. Even Elijah's bones were buried. They threw that dead man in that hole, hit Elijah's bone, he, he came back to life. Now, if you know that principle, then you need to meet with God every day. Let him soak you every day. Why? Because the soaking doesn't leave all the way. You understand? God doesn't leave you. He only broadens and strengthens. Now, he might anoint you for that day or that particular ministry project. Once you got rid of that anointing, might lift. But you, the anointing, corporate anointing in your life and your faithfulness and your consistency is continually to build over and over again. You might get a holy zap to do one project, but that'll probably dip some, but God will continually to build up that holy anointing inside of you that you're saturated. But it takes a period of time. But if he wants, he can go zap, and you can get something done. You go, wow, that was just supernatural. But when you retreat back in, you're going to come to where you are with the Lord. That's why tent meetings, been to so many tent meetings, wonderful tent meetings, where the people's faith is alive and they're shouting, they're dancing. Man, the power of God's great. But when all those people leave and the tent meaning is gone, they're going to come back to where their relationship is with God. And if they didn't have a very strong relationship, the anointing was strong while they were in the tent meeting or in the camp meeting. But now they're anointing. If they don't pursue God after the tent meeting and camp meeting, and that they try to do the immature thing and compare the anointing then as with my walk now, I must be backsliding. No, there's a difference. One's a corporate anointing. The other is the, is the consistent anointing in your life, and it builds. That's why God doesn't want us to quit. He doesn't want us to, even when in my worst situations when I was younger and I had all the problems I had and in every situation, I never quit. I kept on loving God, kept on doing my best, even though I wasn't in any very good condition. Why? Because he's building something in me. I'm not doing it. Folks, remember this, and then we'll get on. And that is, it's not the fact that people don't fall. It's not not falling. You're going to fall. It's how you get up. It's how you get up. And about the time you think you won't fall, you will fall. But it's how you get up. You know, you can sit there and waller and talk about how bad you are and all this. Or you can get up and shut up and rise up to the anointing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, it doesn't sound like a very friendly message, but it's really what we need to be doing. Because that little fall is not our life. God's dealing with the Alpha and the Omega there. The beginning and the ending, right? Not, I fell down and I'm going to sit around and feel sorry for myself. Now get up. 
That's where the victory is in. Jesus getting you up. All right, let's go on. So we found out that uh, then the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them. Remember what they said, these guys? They said, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Let me read it to you. Verse 13. Then some of the interim Jewish exorcists, what a name, huh? Took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Now there's an example. Have we not cast out devils in your name? Didn't they use the name of Jesus? Weren't they casting out the devil? And Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. Well, this spirit realized they never knew him either. <laughs> so let's read this. Kind of a, a kind of a, a sad situation, but look. Okay. We exercise you by uh, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Shiva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. Carrie, I know. Joe, I know. Denise, I know. Terry, I know. Linda, I know. And all the others, I know. But who are you? See, they weren't born again. They were trying to copy and mimic what they heard Paul and what they knew Jesus preached. How many know God doesn't want us to copy or mimic? He wants us to have the real stop stuff, baby. The real stuff. And that comes right when you're faced with God every morning. The real stuff. See, I don't have to convince you what I believe in. I just simply have to tell you what I believe in. And if the Spirit of God doesn't convince you, then guess what? You're not ready. I don't have to sit up and make excuses for myself and try to justify this and, and do that. I did all that when I was younger. Kind of a waste of time at times. You know, especially people ask you questions, they don't really want to know the answer. You ask them, why are you asking me this question? I just want to see what you're going to answer. So, well, look, I'm not going to answer you. If you really want to know, I'll tell you. Right? Isn't that what Jesus did? Are you with me? All right. And then look what it said, verse 17. Okay, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on all of them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those with practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, these people were really into idol, idols, weren't they? <clears throat> Witchcraft. <clears throat> so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Why did the word of the Lord grow mightily and prevail? Because they took care of the darkness that was blinding everybody's mind. Amen. All right. What is man? God is God's design for man. We find it in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now many of God made the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, right? May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good night, bro. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So spirit, soul, and body. So we know, okay? What our spirit is, okay? You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Two, your spirit is where God comes into. It's your conscience, your intuitive center, your hidden man, the hidden man of the heart. It's a life force. And thirdly, your soul consists of your mind, will, emotions, appetites, intellect, and personality. You are a living soul it has a blueprint in there. Only is personally to you. God, that's why nobody else can walk your walk. Only you can walk your walk. That's why it says there's a race set before us, remember? And we're to be looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. We're not racing against each other. And see, this is the thing the devil does. He tries to get people competing and measuring themselves up. It doesn't matter if it's baseball, cooking, doesn't matter. Playing music, 
trying to measure themselves with one another. Forget it. You're the only one like it. There's nobody who can play drums like me. Doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. I'm just a carry drum player that Jesus plays through. You see what I mean? Doesn't make me better or lesser. You see? So there's no competition. I just got to be content with God playing through me and just enjoy it to whatever degree he's given me. To invest it in his kingdom so he can give me more. But I'm certainly not going to bury it in the ground under my flesh. That's what the ground is. The guy with the one talent he thought God was not who he was and this and this and this. So he took his Lord's money and buried it in the ground, right? The Lord gave us all kinds of talents and blessings. But oftentimes, well, people are afraid what other people might say. So they hide it in underground. I'm talking about your, your vessel, your flesh is ground. And if you hide God in your ground, nobody can see him. But if you bring him out in front like a light bulb sits on a light stand, then you got it. Because we're flawed, but God is not. So the more we learn to bring him forward, the less flawed we'll become. Why? Because people see God and they don't see us. Come on, let's move on. All right? Okay, so thirdly, your soul consists of your mind. Fourthly, your body is an earth suit. It's the Greek word soma. Everyone say soma. So me. So me. So me. It's all about me. Me, 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 me. I kind of do that, but you know, I used to do that too. So your body is a nurse suit. That's all it is. Okay? I mean, we know something's wrong when, when you tell your left hand to pick up that piece of ice that fell on the floor or fell on the table and don't leave it melt all over and you can't get your hand to do it. Something's wrong. How did God feel when he asked Carrie to do something and I refused to do it? Carrie with a K. I'm just bringing paralysis in. What happens when you tie off your muscle or your arm or something that you've injured for a period of time? You, you lose your muscle tone. You, you atrophy, don't you? I know when I first went through all that I did, notice my skin hung off of me and I just shrunk in and all that kind of stuff. One person said to me, you just look like skin and bones sitting there. I says, it's not over yet. <laughs> God has better plans for me. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, help and pray that I can get, keep food down, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Having a whole year and a half and not keeping food down. I mean, I'll straighten you out a little bit. Okay, let's go on to five. We are functioning as a spirit being, using our soul, hoping that it has enough information that it will help feed our spirit. You see, working together, our soul working with our spirit, our spirit working with our soul, picking out of our soul the things that God has taught us through his word, through experiences, and then ejecting or rejecting those imaginations that seem to work against God's way and will. That takes a process of time in our soul. We don't learn that overnight. We have to expose ourselves to God. So we are to function as a spirit being using our soul in our body. The spirit is the boss. The soul is the servant and your body is nothing more than a slave. Don't let the slave order <laughs> your spirit what to do. Don't let the slave tell your soul this is your, this is your cross to bear. You're going to have to just go through that. You know, you know how the soul works sometimes. I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but you know how our soul works sometimes. It wants to lay down and kind of gender itself a bit. And we, and we can't really allow that to happen. Say amen, somebody. So when, when mankind fell, this order fell too. No longer was it spirit, soul, and body. It became body, soul, and spirit. <coughs> <coughs> So we have a young child, Carrie Oliphant. At the age five, I noticed things started happening around me that were evil. This thing would come on me and I'd feel weird and want to play with matches. People would do weird things with me. I won't go into detail because people get into trouble for it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's like the enemy was 
set me up hoping that I would never fulfill what God had for me. Now, I didn't know any of that, but I can tell you at times, something was playing with my decisions. Why? The enemy does that with people that have, parent, uh, have children. You have to watch your children's young. You have to know when that transitioning time is, when they switch from the, the spirit realm to the soul, and that's when they need to be born again. Now, both of my children were born again, Right at the time, their spirit needed to be born again. They were raised in a good Christian family, a good household. They, my, uh, but, but all of a sudden, when they got to the age of accountability, knowing right from wrong, and they did wrong several times, and they knew how bad that was, they knew they needed help, the innocent soul will cry out. They wandered up to the altar, each one on their own. Ushers wanted to stop them. They were wandering up to give their heart to the Lord. Why? Because it's natural that way. It's all the confusion and all the other stuff coming from the outside trying to ba keep us in bondage so that we don't grow into the thing and be liberated from the problem that Satan and Adam put upon us. All right, I done preached myself happy. So let's finish up with you guys. Now in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I mean, here it's going to sound even, even better than it already sounds. It says, therefore... Or because of the following verses, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, see the phrase, is in Christ. When we decide, Father, in Jesus' name, we're in Christ. Amen. So when Denise, when Joe, Carrie, when all the rest of you decide, Father, in Jesus' name, we're in Christ. Yeah. It, we're not outside of Creed hoping to be in Christ. No, Father, in Jesus' name, we're in Christ. It's just that simple. If it was any harder, it would be a works program, wouldn't it? It'd be a religious program, wouldn't it? No, Father in Jesus' name. So therefore, if any man be in Christ, as long as we're operating in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, here's what God showed me here recently. When we're not operating from the inside out, we're the old crabby man, the old doubting woman, whatever we were. So therefore, when we're in Christ, we're a new creation. We have new responses New spiritual things that we operate. Do you see it? I hope you see that. Old things have passed away. See, when we're walking in the spirit, we're adults. You see? When we're moving in Christ, the older things that used to bind us up pass away. They're no longer in the forefront of our thinking. When we're operating in Christ, we're not thinking about what we said to Jimmy four days ago that we shouldn't have said. And if there's a Jimmy watch, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Listen to what it says. Therefore, because of the previous, if anyone, that's us, is in Christ, he is a new creation. Anyone being in this church will suffer the cookies and the warm coffee. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If you're outside of Christ, operating in your flesh, you're just operating in the old ways. But he addresses the new thing. Therefore, and that's why religious people go, I just seem to can't, I got to have a breakthrough. I seem to have to break. They, they're wrong focus. Wrong focus. You go to God, he breaks you right through. Now, you might not see any results, for a day or two. When you go to God with it, you know it's done. When I talk with God, I know it's done. God, forgive me. I certainly hope you will. No, you know it's done. And when you say, God, I need your help, you know it's done. He's helping right now. And that's the, that's the, that's the excitement that we talked about and what Peggy talked about, how that we've moved into this realm where it's not so efforting, but it's effortless because we're yoked to Christ. But it takes a period of time for the Holy Spirit to teach us. I never saw it like that. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he operates as a new creature. All things have passed away. They don't get in the way. Behold, all things become new. Our eyes are open to new things. Our ears are open to spiritual things. Why? We're operating in the new creature. The new creature is made after God's image. 
after God's likeness. We're operating in the realm of the spirit. Satan's not here. We don't have to turn around and look behind us. See if he gets you behind me, Satan, you know. Never mind, move on. <laughs> uh, praise God. All right, almost let's get let's finish up with you. Boop. I dropped another paper. Okay. Galatians chapter 5. Here we go again. We're, we're talking about in the, in the spirit, in Christ. Okay? Now the idea is most people don't see it the way it's meant. Now I said this a couple of weeks ago, but I'll say it again. The people, the disciples during Jesus' time and Paul's time, they knew what it was like to be in Christ. Because the whole rest of the world was going to hell in a, in a, in a skyrocket. You know, falling apart everywhere. Persecution. Christians being burnt on sticks and fed to lions. It was just chaos. So the only freedom that they had is absolutely trusting in God. But they understood what that meant. That meant that God held them. I can imagine they couldn't help but reflect back that when Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat and the winds were blowing and everything looked like it was all chaos, Jesus got up and says, oh, you little faith, and he rebuked the winds. Oh, man, God, there's a, there's a Goliath in this situation. What are we going to do? Can you do anything about it now? No, but I can ask you to do something. Okay, David, what do you have in your hands? I have four rocks. Let's use the first one. The rock will hit, but I'll do the lambasting. See, we forget that we have an almighty God that's standing in us, standing around us. He's backing us. He's going before us. But see that we have to come, the eyes are our understanding, and like what, what Joe said earlier, our skills have to fall off until we get that reality. That reality becomes a settled fact to us. It's no longer I hope so, but it's just a settled fact. Someone say amen. So Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, I, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the mealy mouthing of the flesh. No, the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts or desires against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, see? So you either trust the one or trust the other. But this is what they call double-mindedness in James. Remember? It said a double-minded man's unstable in all their ways. And then it says, because like a wave of the sea, driven of the wind, and tossed, let not that man. Well, it's talking about a person that vacillates between the flesh and the spirit, and the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. About the time God's ready to work for them, they operate in the flesh. Oh, I'm afraid. You know, and then God says, no, have strength. Oh, okay. And they're going like this until their walk with God brings them to a place where they're not doing anything but receiving from God and obeying just the simple things he said to do. I mean, God, I know you want to fill my day with all kinds. I just want you to read your Bible today and enjoy life. But don't you think, I, I got, I got, he says, you don't have to do anything. Just read your Bible today. See, that's where we would trust him if he really told us to do that. Now, of course, he's not going to tell us to do that if we know we have a busy day for him. He's not going to interrupt himself. But if we're just busy, like some people, they can't sit still. So they need to really, and I'm not picking on anybody here, uh, you know, but sometimes we just need to be still and kind of just soak a little bit too. So make sure you have that time in, in you, okay? What law? Okay, look at what Romans 8, 1 through 2 says. It says, therefore there is now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Who are in Christ Jesus? We are. So remember we read the scripture before, therefore if any man be in Christ Jesus. And then we read here, therefore there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So while we're in Christ Jesus, our flesh has no say. Amen. Amen. Are you confident enough with, with your walk with the Lord that when your flesh tries to raise his ugly head, you just turn around and say, shut up. Shut up, sit down, talk to your own flesh that way. Don't talk to anybody else. <laughs> just sit, you know. And next thing you know, it just shuts right down and you go, well, 
And then used to, it would, it would do interruptions for a period of time. Now you're shutting right down real quick when you address it. Why? There's no condemnation. Your flesh brings condemnation. Who do not walk after according to the flesh. Why? We're new creatures. We don't walk according to the flesh. We walk according to the spirit. We're new creatures. Therefore, any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away in the flesh realm. Amen. I have two minutes with you, okay? All right, now. Very important. Okay. There is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, that's us, who do not walk according to what the flesh tells them, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, grace, in Christ Jesus, has made, has made, has made, past tense, has made me free from the law of sin and death. But because we're used to walking physically, it takes a process of time to switcheroo. Because that flesh always wants to come in and try to help God, you know. And so it takes a process of time of switching that off. And the only way I know to switch my flesh off quickly and thoroughly is to meet with God first thing in the morning. I don't even have to ask him to switch off my flesh now. I says, Lord, here I am. I certainly could use some help. And you know what hinders me. So, Lord, work it that out in my life. And when I'm in the midst and I'm praying, Lord, I'll pray for Joe and Denise. Oh, Lord, change them, God, you know. No. So, you know, Lord, give them what they need. Help them in every area. Don't let them be frustrated. Don't let any resentment build in them for any reason at all. It's not worth it, Lord God. And by the way, while you're doing that with them, change me as well. You have to include yourself in that too. Because, why? Because none of us are any better than anyone else. And we can't look at saying, oh, God changed Linda. You know, she's your daughter, but, you know, well, that's not going to go over too good. <laughs> you know, God will say, that's my daughter. Keep your hands off of her. I'll let you enjoy her, but don't, you know, don't be cursing her fig tree. You know what I mean? <laughs> she, Got three more just because your hand's bent and pointing back. And that's just a, so. So the idea is why do we want to get bothered and all that stuff anyway? There's nothing we really can do about it. And you got the Christians right now that they got the Trumper and then you got the Never Trumpers. You got the Never Trumpers and you got the Trumpers. And you got the Christian church arguing over whether they like them or not. And you know what? It's never been such a bad testimony for the Christian church. Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Satan doesn't care. So it isn't this against that, and it isn't uh, Apollos against Paul, and, and Cephas against that. See, that's how Satan divides us up. You know, this is the doctrine I believe, so what do you think of that? See, it divides us up already. What do you think about these, you know, what do you think about that divides us up? And, you know, there's a word for that. What do they call it? divisive yeah causing divisiveness between people well they don't quite believe like we do oh yeah well praise the lord's find common ground and stop being divisive get everybody on the defense and arguing and all that kind of bunch of immature stuff hope you're listening by youtube amen the idea is you're to pray for your president those in authority pray for this country be one under god Pray that God get rid of all the iniquity and the wickedness. Just because you have a pet peeve doesn't mean you have the right to be divided up. You have a right to answer to Jesus to make sure that you live in forgiveness and that your heart's ready when he calls you home. So Galatians 5, 21 through 26 says, but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, faithfulness, excuse me, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. What were the Jewish unable to keep? The law. When we're serving God from our spirit, from the new creature, God's doing it, right? In us. We don't have to worry about the law. Shouldn't be our concern. We have two concerns. Make sure we stay in love with God, with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. That'll occupy us all the whole life. Anyway. And 
<clears throat> um, only one that teaches this I know of, that God says, and to love your neighbors as you love yourself. Well, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth in the Old Testament was all fulfilled, right? So it's not as you love yourself. What if you don't love yourself? And you're learning to, to love the Jesus in you, but you're having a hard time with all the old negative self things you keep remembering. So Jesus put a clause in there and he says, no, not as yourself now, as I have loved you. Love others as I have loved you. Why? Because his love is abiding in us. His love wants to work out of us. His love wants to embrace and help every human being. That's who we are. Amen. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. Now the way that that's written sounds like we got to run out there and start whacking ourselves and crucifying ourselves. No. What it's actually saying is it, it says and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires by meeting with God first thing in the morning. It doesn't say that. Well listen, how are you going to deal with things if you don't deal with the master first thing in the morning? You're going to wait to those things that you should have dealt with, beat you up pretty good, and then you're going to meet with God? Well, that's okay too. But you lost a bunch of ground. Meet with him anyway. God, I ever, like the other day I was meeting with him. I said, God, I really don't have anything to ask of you. I know that you supply all my needs, so and I ask so you can do that. But Lord, I just want to spend this time telling you how much I love you. And how much you're beautiful to me. And how much you mean all of these things to me. How much that you help me to love others and help me to be a better person. And just thanking him. Man, we don't have to be ritualistic. Go through the katata, katata, ta ta. I got this covered. No, the idea is open your heart. Be tender, be humble before him. Sincere, heartfelt prayer of a righteous man. Sincere, your heartfelt. You really mean what you're saying, even though you stumble over your words. God sees your heart, you see. So to walk in the spirit is to simply walk from the inside out in step with the Lord. That's all it is. Now, you might be able to do that in certain lengths during the day. You might be able to do a half day of it, maybe a quarter of a day, maybe just a couple hours, but you're doing it. You're being led. And then when things start to tighten up, just go meet with God a couple minutes. Lord, things are getting tight again. I find myself getting a little worked up. Oh, Lord, just thank you. Thank you. I certainly, if, I, if you guys were, you know, and something was, was getting to you, not a person or anything, but like the work's getting to you, just, I wouldn't mind you sit still and start praying a little bit, worshiping a bit, get rejuvenated rather than fall over. You know what I mean? All right, if you got something out of that tonight, will you give the Lord a hand clap? All righty.